Hey, g'day, it's Presso. Thanks for stopping by. Now, today's video is specifically about metal finishing, but we're going to be doing it on the four facet drill grinder that I've been working on for the last six episodes. But before we get started with that, I've got some new stickers, so let's check them out. Our first sticker today comes from a gentleman named Todd Hopkins. Now, Todd lives in Alberta, Canada, just northeast of Calgary. In his letter, he describes himself as being a volunteer firefighter but he's got a lovely uh, home machine shop. He's into just metal machining in general. But here's his uh, YouTube homepage and uh, the logo really made me laugh because when I was a kid, I was a big fan of Wile E. Coyote and Roadrunner and every contraption that uh, Wile E. Coyote came up with to catch the Roadrunner was brand named Acme. But Acme is actually the name, name of the town where Todd lives. So our next sticker comes from Bart Hakima. Now Bart lives in the Netherlands and I would describe Bart as being a sports instructor or a physical education instructor. He's a super super fit guy but he's also an excellent fabricator and metal machinist. And on his YouTube homepage you can see just a glimpse of the sort of work and the scope of work that he does. But I was watching one of his videos one day and it really made me smile and uh, I instantly dubbed him the human power hammer. Now this is Bart making some parts for a metal sculpture and this was uh, donated to one of the sports institutes that he's associated with and he just made this absolutely stunning sculpture out of just lumps of metal. So uh, check him out, uh, there's absolutely something there for everyone. I could highly recommend Bart's channel. Also got a new sticker from Stevie GTR. Now that's the original that I received in the mail I think last year and Stevie tried to print these himself and I think he had a bit of an issue with his uh, printer ink. But here's a new one, professionally printed, that'll last forever. Thanks Stevie. And just turn this envelope over, this is the one that Bart sent me and I had to Google this but that ABS stands for Australian Border Force. So for some reason this looks suspicious and they've opened it, had a peek inside, don't know what they were looking for, I mean it's just an envelope. But uh, the important thing is I got the stickers okay and luckily they didn't destroy anything when they opened it. Alrighty, now this is the uh, drill grinder that I've been working on as you know. And in today's episode I want to do all of the metal finishing on this machine. Now that means that I'm going to sandblast these green painted parts and they will be powder coated. I'll be powder coating the steel base as well and also the carriage. All of the aluminium parts are going to be anodized and the mild steel parts are going to get parkerized. Now when this goes back together again I want it to look nice but also I want it to be as durable as possible and as maintenance free as possible. And I hate having to deal with rust on machinery in my workshop and the anodizing does make these aluminium parts a lot tougher and makes the surface harder. And of course uh, powder coat is a lot more durable than just liquid paint. This is chipping around the edge of this wheel guard here. Now also this wheel guard is a bit useless, it doesn't protrude far enough forward to cover the face of this CBN wheel and uh, this the machine does make a lot of very fine metal dust and if I can trap most of that inside the wheel guard it'll keep the workshop a lot cleaner. Now you can fit a rare earth magnet inside the wheel guard and that will attract and hold most of the dust in there. So the first job before we get started on the metal finishing is to modify this guard here. So this is just an aluminium casting. I'm going to machine off this section of the guard here and then we've got to extend the guard about 55 millimeters from the back face. So I'll make that out of some sheet metal material and uh, then we can go ahead and start the powder coating. Now I'm not going to bore you with a lot of commentary on this. It's just an overview of the processes. I'll put some annotations on the screen as I go and if you want more detail about any of these processes there is a playlist I'll put the link to that up above there now and you can go back and check out the individual processes that I'm doing so this is just a you know like a an overview of the entire process okay let's get started The process for breaking down the machine is fairly straightforward, although there are a lot of specialised fasteners in this build. So rather than just tip them into one big container, I've taken sandwich bags and labelled those for the sub-assemblies, and those fasteners will be stored in those bags, so I've got some clue about where they go when we rebuild the machine. 
Now, most of the fasteners don't need any sort of metal finishing at all, so it's really just storing them temporarily. But all of the metal parts were then sorted into groups that will take either parkerizing, powder coating or anodizing. Sort of got all my parts grouped together now. So these green painted parts are going to get sandblasted and powder coated. All of the steel parts are going to be parkerized. Uh, this aluminum pulley will need to come off. And I do need to look at my notes to try to figure out how this spindle was put together in the first place. I can't remember. Uh, the body and the end caps will get parkerized and probably the spindle itself. And in this box of parts here, these are mostly aluminum parts. Now this uh, V-slot track is already clear anodized, so I won't need to do anything with that. This uh, mounting plate for the motor, that will get uh, sandblasted and powder coated. Most of the other parts in there are going to be anodized. The steel trunnion is okay as it is. That's got the original black middle scale finish on it, so I'm going to leave that. Uh, the carriage plate has got some rust, so I think we're going to powder coat that one. So. What I need to do first though is get over to the lathe. I'm going to modify this wheel cover. Uh, we're going to part off most of the uh, outer section of that wheel cover there and then we'll cut a shoulder and add on the new edge strip. So let's do that. I've got a steel mandrel in the three jaw chuck there and that's the same diameter as the bore in the wheel guard. So I'm going to use the clamping ring to hold that in place but I'm going to back it up with a big steel washer held in place with the tailstock pressure. Now this um, outer line here is where I'm going to part it off and this will be the edge of the shoulder and I'll just turn a parallel section so I can bond a new strip on there. see what happens. Bit chattery. worried about that sort of flimsy ring there sort of opening up as it cut through so that's why I knocked it off with the hammer.
Oh, there's the wheel guard finish now. So what we're going to do is take this next door. We're going to sandblast this and all the other parts need powder coating and get on with that process. Now, in case you're wondering, this little cutout here is for when we use the split point accessory on the drill grinder. And this other big opening was already in the casting anyway, so we just got to live with that. Okay, let's get sandblasting. These parts get a fairly superficial clean in a wax and grease remover just to make sure I don't contaminate the media that I'm using here. Now the media is garnet. It's fairly aggressive. It's good for removing paint and rust and it'll leave a good key on the surface of these parts for the powder coat. Well, all those parts are done now. The castings are looking nice and clean with all the paint being removed from those. These flat sheet parts are ready. And here's the wheel cover. Now I did fill the gap between the sheet metal shroud and the casting with some JB Weld. And that was sanded off and I just re-blasted that surface there. When that's powder coated it will look like one continuous surface. Now what I need to do next is just blow the dust off these parts and we need to protect the bores by either taping that or packing it with alfoil or something like that to prevent the powder coat from getting into those bores there. With any drilled and tapped holes uh, you can plug those or you can just run a tap back through it when you're done. But a bit of preparation now saves a lot of work later. So there's the part that's now ready for powder coating. As you can see, I filled that bore. This hole here, I'm going to leave that open. I can put a wire hook through there so I can hang the part while I put the powder coat on. And what I'll do now is get all of the rest of the parts prepped and then we'll put the powder coat on. This is the powder coating setup that I use at home here. This is a single voltage Eastwood gun and I purchased this from the United States. It was a fairly expensive purchase because I had to pay for shipping and also the exchange rate wasn't good at the time but it's probably one of the best purchases that I've made in terms of being able to finish products at home here. Now, this is the powder that I'll be using on the castings. This is called Shimmer River, and it's a nice textured silver coating, and that'll work out well on these castings because they're a bit rough. Uh, once I remove the paint and also the filler, you can see the texture of the casting underneath there. But I think this uh, Shimmer River powder will help to cover that. You can see on the bore on this big casting here, I've just used a piece of cardboard tube. That'll be fine. It'll withstand the heat of the, the oven quite well. Now on the uh, motor housing or the fan housing for the motor, I'll be using a satin black and I'll do the same on the steel base for the grinder.
I'm only going to put two parts in the oven at the moment simply because there's not a lot of room. You've got to be really careful you don't allow the parts to touch each other or touch the wall of the oven because it will leave a mark in the surface. Now, depending on the size and the weight of the part, it can take between 5 and 20 minutes for the surface start to change. When you see the surface texture start to go smooth or glossy, you then leave it for another 10 to 12 minutes for the powder to fully cure. When that happens, just take it out, hang it up, let it cool down in air. Well, there's our carriage plate, and that one's done. The casting that I put in about 10 minutes ago is still getting to that stage where the powder is starting to flow out, but this one is done. That's our wheel guard done. It's looking slick. All these parts are cooled down now, so it's a simple matter of just removing the plugs that were protecting those uh, bigger diameter holes and the threaded holes. This aluminium can be removed really easily. Now you can use like wooden plugs, you can use um, plywood plugs, whatever you like really. It's just something to protect that bore there. Uh, this might need a little bit of clean up just with a bit of emery cloth on the inside there. But that's done. Uh, this is the motor plate. That's with the satin black. This is the carriage plate and it's come out really nice and the good thing about this stuff is it's really super tough and durable it's uh, chemical resistant oil resistant it can take a lot of um, you know wear and tear before it starts to show any damage now um, I've got a couple of parts still cooling down but the next step is to get on and do the parkerizing on these steel parts and I've already started cleaning these up now these don't need to be like a mirror finish, uh, no matter what you do to it, it's always going to end up with a sort of a, an eggshell finish. You won't get that super shiny appearance when you use parkerizing. Now I'm using a combination of working on the scotch Sprite wheel on my buffing machine. I'm also doing some of these parts in the lathe using some emery cloth just sort of cleaning off the rust and the last of the oxide that was on those parts. So here's a couple here that have been done. And like I say, you don't need to get that super shiny finish on it, as you see when we get on to the parkerizing step. I just want to give you a really brief overview of this parkerizing process because I've done it in several other videos. But I want to show you how I've got it set up in my workshop today. This is the first step in the process. This is an ultrasonic cleaner. This just ensures that the parts are chemically clean, they don't have any oil or contaminants on them. And then in my wood workshop, I've got set up the next couple of stations. So this is just a cold water rinse bath. We use that between a couple of the steps in the process. This is a, an activator. It's an acidic liquid. We put the steel parts in there and that prepares the surface to receive the Parker phosphate. This uh, big boiler here is just uh, sitting on a, like a small hot plate. This just brings the temperature of the parts up to, you know, close to the parkerizing uh, bath temperature and then they go into the parkerizing bath which is here. This is also sitting on a small hot plate but it's being controlled by this PID thermostat controller. So we want this uh, parkerizing bath to be running at about 97 degrees centigrade. Now you don't want it boiling because then all that happens is uh, the water content in the parkerizing fluid boils off and you've got to keep replenishing it. So it's sitting right on 97 degrees centigrade now which is about ideal. And the last step in the process is over here. And this stuff here is a, a water-soluble oil. That's what it is. <laughs> it's a water-soluble oil. Now, it's sold as a dry-touch oil. 
but as the parts come out of the park rising bath they get rinsed and then they go into here and this oil absorbs into the porous coating on the park rise parts and help prevent corrosion. Okay so let's run a few parts through and uh, we'll just look at the whole process from start to finish. These are the parts that I took out of the dry touch oil about two days ago now and these are ready for assembly. And I think you can see what I was talking about when I said it's not worth getting a mirror finish on these steel parts because no matter what you do, when it comes out of the parkerizing process it will always have that slightly dull eggshell finish on it. And that's the magic ingredient, that's what holds the oil in the surface of the steel and prevents any further corrosion. Now I'm just going to put these parts aside and in case you're wondering this is the spindle out of the corn tool and cutter grinder head and I've cold blued both ends of that. Now the reason for that was that I wasn't uh, happy about putting this in the park rising bath because one of the bearing races is pressed in and I couldn't get it out, it's like a, a blind fitting. So I just left it in there and I just used a cold blue finish on both ends of that. Now normally I don't like using cold blue but in this case it was my only option and there's only a very small amount of this showing at both ends of the casting that it fits into. Okay let's have a look at the anodizing process. Here's a selection of parts that need to be prepared before they go into the anodizing bath. Now all of these parts have got scratches and nicks and bits of damage and so on. There's machining marks and you have to make a decision at this point as to how much work you want to do. Now if I was doing a museum piece I'd go to a lot more trouble but since this is going to be a practical tool I'm going to use what I call a squint and hold it at arm's length type finish. <laughs> 
uh, which means that it's going to look nice from a distance. But at the end of the day, what I want to do is protect this material from corrosion and I also want to give it some colour and uh, that's about it. So my process for getting these parts ready is simply to deburr all of the sharp corners and edges. I'll then put these parts onto a piece of granite countertop. So this is not a granite surface plate, this is just a piece of nice flat granite material. Got this for, uh, for $5 from the tip. And using a brace of paper, I'll rub the surface until it's got a grain. And then from there, I'll go either to a Scotch-Brite wheel or a Scotch-Brite belt. And in some cases, I'll use uh, like a fine Scotch-Brite pad just to give it a bit more grain when I'm done. Now, at the end of all of those steps, you get something like that. So that now has an even luster all over. I wasn't after a mirror finish on these parts because I found it's not worth it. After the anodizing process, a mirrored finished part will come out with a slightly duller texture anyway. So what I was after here was to get like an even straight grain. Uh, I've removed most of the damage that's easily removed. I've made sure that everything's got a soft corner or soft edge on it. And the next step is to clean these parts. Now, by cleaning, I mean that they've got to be chemically clean. And that means going into the ultrasonic cleaner like we did for the steel parts and we need to remove any traces of grease or wax or oil or dirt as you can see inside that counterbore there. Now after they come out of the ultrasonic cleaner they need to be wired up electrically. Now anodizing is an electrochemical process so we need to make sure that we have excellent conductivity between the part and the power supply.
This is the dye that I'm going to be using on these parts. Now this is a Caswell dye called Electric Blue and I was browsing through the Caswell forum a while ago and I came across this document here and this is called Dyes Optimum pH and I'll put a link to this in the description of this video but it lists all of the Caswell dyes and gives you the optimum pH for that particular dye. So in the case of Electric Blue we're looking for 6 and we're going to check this in a minute. Now I had a problem with my black dye instead of coming out that really rich black it was coming out a sort of a charcoal grey or a silvery grey and uh, I suspected there was something wrong with the anodizing process I was going through but when I checked the pH of that dye it was way too high and I had to bring it back down to the appropriate level. Now let's just check this. I bought this uh, digital pH meter and uh, I've already dipped this in the dye, that's why it's reading low. But let's check it again. And that is giving me a reading of 4, which is again way too low. We need to bring that back up, and you can do that by adding sodium hydroxide. Now it can be fairly dilute, and you only need a few drops. So let's do that. Let's see if we can get it back to 6 instead of 4. Give that a bit of a stir. Alright, not much change. Let's add some more. Alright, so we're coming back up. We're 4.6. Stabilize there, do a bit more. Alright, overshot a bit, so we're about 6.3, 6.4, 6.5. Six <laughs> but I think that'll be okay. Now I've got a heater in here and I'm setting the temperature of my dye bath to what's that 121 degrees Fahrenheit. If we've done everything correctly we should see that colour change within a few minutes. Now if you're not seeing that there's either something wrong with your dye or you've done something wrong in the anodizing process. Okay dye is hot so we're just going to put these parts in and it should only take a minute or so before you start to see the colour. So I'll leave that one there and we'll come back to that in a minute. These pegs are just so I don't lose the wire. <laughs> Some of the shorter ones can tip over in the bucket. You see that one is just starting to show some colour. And that's been a minute. So I'm fairly confident it's all going to work. That's been five minutes and there's the index ring now. That's still not the colour I want. I want it to be darker than that. But I just leave it in for another 10, maybe 15 minutes. It'll go that really rich blue. And here's the pulley, and that's a complete failure. You can see how it looks all speckled there, and that's the result of pitting that I didn't remove during the cleaning process. So I'm just going to cut my losses there and powder coat that. So I won't put that one back in. Okay, it's been about 20 minutes, maybe 25, and that's the colour we're at now. There's a part that I did earlier, and that's my standard. That's what I want to match in terms of the depth of colour. Now these will go darker if you leave them in longer and after they're boiled to seal in the dye they will also go a little bit lighter. So it's a bit of a judgment call, you've got to decide when it's at the, the sort of colour level that you want. So the boiling process seals off the porous layer and traps the dye below the surface and that takes about 15-20 minutes in boiling water and then that's it, the part's finished. So I'm going to get these processed and then we'll have a look at them all when they're done and we'll put the machine back together. Now the machine's all back together again now and it's all working as you can see. Haven't actually ground any drill bits on it since I put it back together again though. Now I'm going to hold that over for the next video unfortunately. I've just sort of run out of time for today. And in that next video we're also going to look at calibrating this eccentric wheel which gives you the different clearance angles you need for the primary clearance on the end of the drill bit. 
I also want to time how long it takes to either regrind a drill bit that's already been done on this machine or to grind a like a blunt or damaged drill bit. Some people have been interested in what that time cycle is, so I'll have a look at that. And uh, overall I'm sort of happy with the way this has turned out. I think the, the metal finishing process is always the, the most exciting or the most interesting part of finishing off a project. And I think it allows you to sit back and actually enjoy the machine a lot better if you've taken a bit of care to present it well. Now I've also made this little wooden box here. This carries all of the accessories for the machine. On the lid of the box I've got a laser engraved chart which shows you the different colt sizes and the different clearance angles that they require. And inside we've got the collets, the collet nut spanner, I've got the setting bar which is used to set the position of the grinding wheel relative to the trunnion and I've got the gauges that are used to set the stick out on the drill bit as well. Now this little box was laser cut, so this carcass here is made of New Guinea rosewood and all of the finger joints there were just simply cut on my CO2 laser which is a really really super handy way of doing it. So that's uh, the accessory box for the machine. Now there was one other accessory that I didn't consider but I've got a storage spot for that so we'll have a close up view of where that is. Now there was a spare spot down here in the corner of the base and I've used that to store the jig which is used to align the drill bit lips in the collar chuck and this is just a 3D printed clip which is uh, stuck to the base there with some double sided tape. Now it doesn't hold it super super strongly um, but I can always reprint that and, uh, and make a new one if it's not secure enough which I'm starting to think it's not. <laughs> It was alright this morning. I might have to heat that up a bit and just sort of bend it a bit closed. But that's where that's going to live. Just one final thing I want to share with you before I wind up here today is this little uh, curiosity here. Now this is the pulley which drives the grinding spindle on this machine. And I made that part about 10 years ago when I built the corn tool and cutter grinder. And I anodized the pulley alongside all of the other parts. Everything went well until I put it into the die then I realized that this particular part wasn't picking up the die at all. Now the pulley itself is a little bit complicated because there are labyrinth seals on both ends of the spindle and that means that this collar has to have a, an annular groove in the face and that means uh, trepanning out that groove and I must have got lazy and just decided to actually make that part separately and then stick it on with Loctite. And what's happened is that that collar is completely electrically isolated from the rest of the part. And in anodizing, if it doesn't conduct electricity, it doesn't anodize. Now, if I'd known ahead of time what was happening here, I could have just simply jammed a piece of wire between the two parts of the pulley, and that would have allowed it to conduct the charge and it would have worked. But uh, it just uh, proves the point that you must have good electrical conductivity between the parts and the power supply when you're anodizing. However, you don't see much of it, so I'm gonna get away with it. <laughs> well, that's it, and thank you for sticking with me right to the end of this video. Now, I know it's been a long one. I promise the next one will be a bit shorter. Now, don't forget, if you want the drawings for this build, you can get those using the link in the description. I've also put a link to the Caswell die chart and also the two YouTube channels that I featured in today's video. Now I'm going to finish up today by showing you two different bird species that we saw in our yard over the last couple of weeks. Now the first one of these is called the pale-headed rosella. Now these are a very dainty, pretty little bird. They eat seeds from native grasses and you often see them together in pairs. And when you see them at a distance they appear to be just sort of jumping off the ground all the time but what they're doing is they're leaping up and trying to grab hold of the seed heads and pull them down so they can strip the seeds off. But they are a very, very pretty little bird. Now, by contrast, we have the white ibis, also known as the bin chicken here in Australia. Now, if these birds were people, we would call them bogans. Now, bogan is an Australian term for an uncouth person. And the reason they have this reputation is because they're scavengers. And they also tend to hang around urban areas. And you'll often see them in outdoor cafes and outdoor restaurant strips and they'll leap onto the tables and they'll clean any food off the plates that they can find. They'll even steal food out of the hands of patrons. And I've seen them break glassware and scatter plates and cutlery and so on. 
they tend to be a real nuisance. But like I say, if you ever hear somebody talk about bin chickens, that's what they are. Okay, thank you very much. I'll see you next time. Cheers.